what I really kind of want to drill down into here is how you remain calm during a crisis. And it seems maybe oxymoronic that we're talking to Kenny about being calm because, I mean, <laughs> you know, you're gesturing wildly and everything like that. But the reality is, you know, when it comes to your investing, you really do kind of take an unemotional approach to it. So uh, uh, how do you do that? And how do you advise your clients in terms uh, okay. of Okay, let, let me just be honest with you because I appreciate that. It took a long time for me to be able not to be emotional, right? When you're younger, you're more emotional, right? You got more mm -hmm. testosterone, so you're more emotional. Um, so I think part of it is because I've gotten older and less testosterone, less emotional. But um, it took a long time to not be nervous every time there was bad news out of the market sold off when you were younger and you were putting money to work. Oh, my God, you know, you're going to lose everything. It, it, you, I, it, it, it takes time to get over that. That's not, it's not really easy. Uh, you can't just say to somebody, oh, you know, get over it and don't be so emotional. It takes people have to get there on their own right now. In this case, like this in this latest turmoil that we're in now, you know, I've got now that I'm on the, the money management side of the business versus the transaction side that I spent 40 years on. I'm now on the money management side. So now you become, you know, a wealth advisor, a wealth manager. You talk to people, you bring them in off the ledge sometimes if they get nervous. And, you know, listen, the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank and all that crisis that surrounded it created a lot of phone calls with yeah. clients. A, wanted right. to know, A, did we have exposure? What, what exposure, you know, if it wasn't Silicon Valley Bank, what other banks did we own that were regionals that weren't big money center banks? I got a call one night from a woman who said to me, she just wanted to sell everything and, and, and she didn't know what to do with her money. I said, okay, take a deep breath, slow down. First of all, you don't have any exposure to the regional banks. You've got, you have banks, but they're the big money center banks. And those are the ones that are at this moment that are going to be the winners. So yeah. number one, calm down. Number two, even if the broader market sells off, once again, your, your portfolio is positioned, right? You're more defensive. We built that up, not because we knew this crisis was coming, but because of where we are just in the in the last year, right between the Fed and policy and and the administration and the spending and the not spending, whatever, um, and so we built that. So don't don't panic. And so, quite honestly, look where we are. The the market's been trading really in a very tight range. If you look at it over the last three or four months, it hasn't really gone. You know, forty one sixty five on the upside and forty one hundred maybe on the downside. Over the well, four thousand and fifty on the downside. You know, if you go look at the chart, and so it's been in a really tight. Uh, range and so we talked about that and I talked her off the ledge and you know let's not make an emotional decision but ultimately if she was that nervous and she wanted out then we're going to move it into treasuries right we're just going to put it into short duration t bills that we're earning you know five percent on three and six month t bills if she was that nervous something I told her she shouldn't do but if she, ultimately the decision is is hers um and so in fact she didn't right she 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 took a step back she took a deep breath. She tr she's younger than me. She trusted my advice and my judgment and kind of my insight. Um, and so w I had a lot of those conversations, as I'm sure so many wealth managers had those conversations with clients. Right? Maybe the younger ones weren't so weren't so concerned because they didn't nearly have you know a ton of money at risk. Um, and maybe they you know maybe they're just less concerned. Right? Um, but for the most part, it was. Uh, it's been an interesting time, but it's been that way um, for a while. But I'll tell you, back in, you know, back in 1987, when the market crashed, we lost 22 and a half percent in six and a half hours. I was only 26 years old. Right. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have anything to lose other than the house we just bought. So I didn't have extra cash. I didn't have a lot in my retirement account. So I didn't have a lot to lose. But I witnessed, you know, when I was on the floor and I thought all these guys that were 60 years old at the time then who saw the market crash. And remember, when the market crashed in 87, it was the index that was down 22.5%. But you had individual names that got absolutely slaughtered on that day. Johnson & Johnson, which is you know big mega cap name, everybody owns it, right? Um, that stock had closed at $96 on the Friday night before the 16th. On the Monday night, the 19th, Johnson & Johnson closed at $45. It literally lost 50% of its value in one day. Now, partly because... You remember the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the craziness that we, oh, were you guys there in 1987? Were you, um, I was, I was in junior high. 
Okay, uh, so you weren't so, there. Yeah. in a room. Okay, so but so, I, I got to say, your story on it, I think, paints the best picture because I've heard your story a number well, of times. Yeah, Go ahead. And, and so and so, you know, you witness you, you, when you saw things like Johnson and Johnson lose fifty percent of its value. You know, first of all, a, it was it was clearly concerning. How could that possibly happen? But when you think of it, it's because they couldn't sell the other stuff. Like I said, I keep using Bank of Hawaii because right. who wants Bank of Hawaii? And so you can't sell it. So these asset managers that were directed to raise cash, raise cash, raise cash to protect the portfolio because they all bought that portfolio insurance. Yep. They sold what they could. And so those big mega cap names got crushed, crushed. But they were also the first ones to rally right back because they got so artificially dislocated that they bounced right back. And as ugly as it was and as uncomfortable as it was, um, what you realize is when you go back and you look at it, you know, that was such an overreaction and so many names were dislocated. It really was an opportunity. And so I would say that to anybody like, like some of the regional banks that got really beaten up. I said, quite honestly, there are some names in the regional banking industry that I really like that are not going to be affected because they're not serving that tech sector. They're not located in California and Silicon Valley. New York community bank was, you know, was one of those names that got completely slaughtered was a name that I liked. And so, you know, it's a matter of having that conversation and bringing, quite honestly, the wealth of experience and time and grade and maturity to the conversation. And I don't mean maturity like they're not mature. What I mean is time and grade, that yeah. kind of maturity, right? right? Experience. The, expo the experience, right? Yeah. The experience that I've had over the 40 years and understanding um, that unless the story fundamentally changes on an individual name, um, when the stock gets dislocated, it's not because of the fundamentals that change. It gets dislocated because, you know, some of these big asset managers are raising cash. So Apple gets, you know, down 18%. Amazon goes down 25%. But guess what? Amazon's not going out of business. Apple's not yeah. going out of business. Those, those declines, in my mind, present opportunities for the long-term investor. And if you're a day trader, you, you know, you love that you love the you love the noise, right? You love the noise. But as a long-term investor, you actually 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 have to eliminate the noise. And the noise is hard to eliminate today because there's so much of it, right? It's on Twitter, it's on LinkedIn, it's on Bloomberg, it's on Reddit, it's on Discord, it's on all these places that give people all this information and access that it creates a lot of noise. And so the toughest part about, especially in a market sell-off, is you know, trying to decipher what's the noise and what isn't, right? And what's really important in this case and what isn't. And I always use that analogy, you know, like when a name like Apple or Amazon or Google or Johnson & Johnson or Coca-Cola, when these names sell off and people go, oh my God, I have to sell my Apple. When, when, when Nordstrom puts a, has a sale and puts, you know, the ladies' dresses on sale down 30%, the women run in and buy three of them because how could they leave them on the shelf? They can't. They're down 30%. I say to myself, use that same logic when you're talking about Apple and Amazon and Johnson and Johnson and Microsoft. Use that same logic. Unless, of course, the fundamental story of that stock has changed. And if it hasn't, then that logic always carries you through. In the yeah. end, you will be, you will be better off. And especially the other thing is that you until you get to the point where you need maybe the dividend the dividends as income, you should automatically be signing up for dividend reinvestment. Just, just with your eyes shut, you buy the stock, you go into your account, make sure that you are automatically signed up for dividend reinvestment, and then you just shut your eyes and just let it go. You know, keep. Keep consistent to the plan. It's all about the plan, right? Have that long-term goal always in sight and try to eliminate the noise in, in, the, in the middle, you know? Well, you know what? I want to kind of dig a little deeper here on the, the, the opportunities versus the ones that, you know, I, using your Nordstrom example, there are sometimes some of the dresses are just crap. You know, either they're just exactly. out of style and, and, and you, you don't want to touch them. Right? Eggs, and you don't. Then you don't. You go in there and you go, not. Nah. But but at a price, down 30% may not be right. But if it goes down 50%, someone's going to say, ah, you know what, I'm going to take a shot on this. Yeah. Right? The uh -huh. same thing in stocks. The thing could be off 20% and someone goes, eh, I think it's got more to go. So I'm not there yet. Yeah. Right? At a certain but point, you, you, can, better... you can just use them as rags. Right. You know, you don't exactly. have to use them as dress anymore. <laughs> exactly. But here's, the, but here's the other point is that people have to remember. I always find this amazing because when the market sells off hard, it goes, oh, my God, everyone's selling. Well, that's really impossible. That's a, that's a misnomer. Because mm -hmm. in order for me to sell, somebody has to buy. Otherwise, right. the market doesn't function. So for right. every seller, there is a buyer. 
And so the difference is when the market sells off like that is that the buyers see it coming. They see this avalanche of people running at them. So instead of bidding 50, they go, fuck, why do I want to get run over? So they draw their bid and they bid 48 or they bid, right? I mean, I'm being right. dramatic when I talk about the price. April. But that's exactly what happens. But though, that's right? exactly. And listen, but it happens the other way too, because when True. the data suddenly turns and becomes positive, the sellers are in control. That's mm-hmm. when, what, when, when the market's on a rally, it's the sellers who are in control, not the buyers. And when the market's under pressure, it's the buyers who are in control. Right. Because the buyer, because you're the one who's so anxious to sell it. I go, ah, I'm licking my lips. Okay, here I go. You know, you're down two percent or whatever it is. You make your bids, and, and that's and so that's how the market functions. So I, that's another point that I try to always make investors aware. You're not in this alone. There's somebody on the other side of every trade. So while you think it's a sell. I may think it's a screaming buy, yeah. right? We're down 18%. Why wouldn't I buy Apple down 18%? No, it doesn't mean I'm, doesn't mean I'm taking all my money and buying Apple all today. I don't. I feather it in over time. I'll buy a little bit here. I'll wait until it reacts. There's not a little bit. I'll buy more. I'm always averaging down on my cost, right? If the stocks I own are trading above my average cost, I let them trade. Unless there's some important reason I run right in after them and want to buy more. But most of the time, I let them trade if they're above. When they come below my average price, then I'll start to buy more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's just the, that, now. That's just me. That's how I kind of yeah. you know. And then the other thing that I do to offset, without getting complicated, you know, coming up with all these complex strategies, I just use some of the contra contra trades to give me downside protection. So, for instance, the PSQ gets you short uh, the Nasdaq. The SH gets you short the S and P. So you buy the SH to get short the market. Mm-hmm. Or you buy the PSQ to get short the NASDAQ, right? Or you buy the VIXI, the VIXI, which is a play on the fear index, right? So you want to go long the VIXI if you think suddenly fear is going to shoot higher, the market's going to sell off. The VIXI, you know, that could be up 15% in one day, like with your eyes shut. And so I use those kinds of products to offset uh, my long portfolio. I don't, I, I don't, I, I rarely sell anything. And the only reason I would sell any of the stocks I own is because the fundamental story has changed. And that's the lesson I try to bring. Those are the conversations I have with people, you know, when they get in, I don't, I don't, you know, when I'm allocating or, or helping people manage money, it's very much a conversation. You know, it's like you and I, it's like, you know, husband and wife, you're having this conversation, you're making these decisions together. Now I may be guiding them because they don't understand it, but they're very much part of the conversation. Yeah. Right. yeah, and, and it's really how, much how question asking? You know, you're asking the right questions. Right, right. correct. And, and how were those conversations last year when it, it was uh, obviously this year we've been bottoming and yeah. and going sideways and getting more tight and things yeah, like yeah. that. Last, well, year last year they were difficult. Yeah, last yeah. year they were difficult. Let's be honest, because the market the market sucked last year. I mean, the yeah. Nasdaq was down 35. percent The Nasdaq, right. the Dow. The, I mean, the, although the Dow did the best uh, out of out of all of them, but um, the Nasdaq. Then the S&P did get crushed. And so they were difficult conversations to have. Yeah. And because you couldn't, you know, you, you couldn't make the market go up under that. Yeah. And so all you had to do was continue to, there were a lot of conversations. You spoke to people more often than you, when the market goes up, people go, ah, you don't need to call me. But when right. the market's down, they want to talk to you every day. Yes. You know what I mean? Yes. And so exactly. there were a lot of conversations and they were, some were very difficult to have because uh, people were very nervous, right? Especially mm-hmm. people, people, you know, at my end of the scale were very nervous. Um, and so some people did, in fact, make, you know, make requests to want to become even more defensive. Let's get, let's get out some names and just put them in treasuries. I want to just, I just want to be in treasuries. Okay. Right. And, and so you, as a, you do it, um, you do it because it's ultimately their money and, right. and that's what they want to do. So you want them to be comfortable, right? If you keep fighting them on it, say, no, no, no. And it goes down, down, down. Then, you know, <laughs> they come back and they say to you, uh, uh-uh, I told you I didn't want to <laughs> yeah. do that. So, exactly. you know, you have to respect what they say. Um, as long as you have a conversation, about it. I'll end in the end, I'll do what you want me to do, but I'll, but I'm going to have a long conversation with you about why it is what we have and what we think. And, you know, it, but it was, let's be honest, it was a difficult year last year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, can you con- contrast that kind of idea of, I mean, last year, it was a market where, you know, you'd had some rallies, but then we kept on going to, to new lows. Right. And again, I would imagine, especially for those that are on the on the older side, that being really kind of tough, because you're like, okay, if this just keeps on going lower and lower, right? how long does it take for me to get back, you know, what I, what I lost? <laughs> well, now, yeah, go ahead. Well, okay. So to your point, if you do absolutely nothing, 
Uh, mm -hmm. Meaning, if you don't take new money and dollar cost average down, bring your cost down. If you do nothing and you just leave your cost, it's going to take you a whole lot longer to get back, right? Yeah. Because, right? But if you are, you know, putting new money to work in the in the best of the names that mm -hmm. are coming under pressure, you're bringing your dollar cost average down. So therefore, the 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 rally back takes less time. Yeah. It takes time for sure. But as long as you're comfortable in the names that you own, and as long as the stories for why you own them have not really fundamentally changed, that's when you have to convince somebody that the right thing to do is to continue to put money to work in this name, right? Mm -hmm. And I had this conversation, I was at the Forbes Investor Conference last week, and, and, and you know, somebody in the crowd asked about NVIDIA. NVIDIA is a perfect example, right? The semis were getting crushed last year, and NVIDIA is a big popular name, and that was down you know, 40% at the end of the year last year, but it was a name that I like, and it was a name that I own. It was a name that, you know, as difficult as it was, I kept going, oh, it hurts every time I buy a little bit more. But I said, I'm in this for the long haul. The story for NVIDIA has not really changed, and so look at it today. It's up 96% this year, right? So, and, and, and I've not only exceeded because I, I kept buying it. So my average cost came down. So now I'm well, once again, I'm well above my average cost. And so therefore it, it came back quick. Now, had I not done that, I wouldn't even be back to my average cost yet. You know well, what I mean? Yeah. It's, so, so that, that's the part that you have to, you know, be able to express and be able to discuss um, and get somebody really comfortable with, and that and that really happens when you have really high qual in an environment like this. You want to have high quality names uh, in your portfolio. Now, Nvidia in this case is not a it's a very small dividend payer, I think, right? It's not a, it's not a big dividend payer, but um, right. you know, in the other in the other some of the other big names, IBM, right? General Electric, uh, not General Electric, American Telephone, which is a really boring name. It's a really boring name, but it's a it's nearly a seven percent dividend. General Mo uh, uh, American Telephone. Um, and it's mostly a good store of value for somebody, right? Because it doesn't really move a whole lot. They pay you a significant amount to own it. Um, and you just keep reinvesting. And I did, and I did that because listen, it's, it, it, I'm still under the water a little bit in, in my telephone from where I started buying it, but I'm closer, I'm closer than I was. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's just because you, you stick with the plan, yeah. right? You don't veer off the plan and decide you're going to change the rules. Yeah. Right. So now in 2020, were you having those, did you have to uh, calm people down at, at, at that point when everything was working? Well, and you, mean everyone, when co you mean when COVID hit? When COVID hit and when the markets just took off, did you have to kind of have different conversations say, hey, you know, things are getting way out of control and people are probably taking too much risk and, and yes. things like that? Yes. But remember that, you know, first we went through March when, when right. COVID first yes. hit and yes. the market got yes. crushed. And right. so when the rally back, people were anxious, you know, they, oh, I'm going to make my money back. It was that whole thing about, you know, I'm right. there, I'm there, I can feel it, I can feel it. But you did have the conversation about how it had gotten extended, you know, and how it had gotten too far too fast. But um, on the way up, it's always funny. When stocks are going up, it's not nearly the same conversation as when they are when, when they're coming under pressure, right?